Okay, in the back of the Cornell notes that students are taking today, we have the periodic table of element formation. And you can see that lithium was formed by cosmic rays. You can see that calcium was formed by large stars. And you'll notice that carbon was formed by cosmic rays. And smaller stars can form carbon and nitrogen as well. So the symbols there are associated with the star type. Yes, so Jupiter has a moon that's larger than our Earth. Ganymede. Here we get that star formation video. This is some of the last or beginning stages of the star where it's trying to capture gases. becomes high enough to ignite steady hydrogen burning, it becomes a main sequence star. So even though there's a lot of friction, the heat is high, um, but you have to have a lot of heat to get the uh, fusion to occur. Which one, raise your hand, you think it is. You think our solar system started by the catastrophic hypothesis or the evolutionary hypothesis? Okay, I'm two. Actually, there's a third one, so I don't think either one of these. This dense, cold nebula out here, and uh, what brings them together? Why do uh, these nebulas want to come together? What's up with a G? Very good. Very good. Gravity. So, gravity is what pulls these things together. And as the uh, protostar grows, the gravitational acceleration of the gases causes it to heat and begin glowing. Because the gravity is moving them around and creates friction. The friction is what produces the heat. Remember we mentioned that? So you have the friction making the heat, and you have pressure and the heat causing fusion. The modern theory of planet formation is associated with the solar nebula hypothesis. I was just testing you to see whether you heard about the solar nebula hypothesis. So go home tonight, Heather, and talk to your, you have an older brother or younger sister? I have an older sister. You go home and you say, have you ever heard of the solar nebula hypothesis? She's not very smart. <laughs> now, come on now. Don't... Be nice. Science in the news, North Korea. They dropped 160 kiloton nuclear bomb. Actually, they blew one up in the ground. But the question now is, what was the kiloton dropped on Hiroshima to end the World War II? Right now, what was kiloton? Was it two one kiloton bombs? No, it was actually um, a 15 kiloton bomb. Right? Then they dropped another bomb on Nagasaki. How many kiloton was it? Ten. It was larger. Yeah, there was little boy. Little boy and then like Bat Batman or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it was like 21. Good job, Chris. 21, 21 kilotons, right? So North Korea just blew a bomb with like 160. Now, the largest nuclear bomb ever exploded was by Russia. I think it was like 50,000 kilotons. It was huge. Um, so they're not there yet, but it's still a lot larger than the two bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. They would both fall into this category right here, the 10, the 20 category. 160 is, is a lot bigger. Now, if you've been following the news, North Korea wants to obliterate Japan. They said, that's what they said, you know, they always want to make it disappear. So that the news today. When you have the ability to make a 160 kiloton bomb, you have to take them seriously. You have to say, okay, that is a serious statement that you're making. So governments, especially Japan, they know, if you went into their classroom and you asked them what was the kiloton dropped on Hiroshima, they're going to they're gonna say that because they know it's happened to them before, right? And when somebody else makes a threat to them, they're, they're going to take it pretty seriously. What did uh, North Korea do to Japan today? Right now? Today. Today. No, they shot another missile over their country. And they just did one, like, in the last month, too. So this is the second time they shot a missile over their country. And then they said they wanted to... Obliterate, you know, cast them into the ocean, 
Japan. That's what North Korea said to Japan. So, be aware that that's in the news. We review dimensional analysis and we're introducing the life cycle of a star. You might know the first step for the life cycle of a star. It starts with the nebula. If you remember the video we just showed, you see the gas is moving around. The gases are associated with the nebula. It's this big cloud of dust and gas. And then you can form a protostar. What were the two things you need to form a protostar? You might know. About Austin. You know what the two things needed to form a star? One starts with a P, one starts with an H. No. Go swimming in a pool, the further, the further down in the water you go, the higher the, raise your hand. Further down you dive into the water, the higher the, raise your hand. Pressure, very good. So you need a high pressure, and you also need a high what? Gabriel, good job. Hi, what? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Michaela? Hi. Austin? Temperature. You know how it's temperature. You get the temperature by the friction. So the hydrogen's moving around, creates the friction. You have so many of them in the glass, you get that pressure. And then you get high temperatures and then you can have fusion occur. Our star is a main equilibrium star. And equilibrium is a balance between gravity pulling atoms toward the center and gas pressure pushing heat and light away from the center. The equilibrium for a protostar occurs when gas pressure equals gravity. That's important. Okay, so we, we've learned here that it takes about 10 billion years for a protostar to become a star, what are the two requirements for star formation? One starts with a P. You go swimming in a pool, the further down you go, the higher the pressure. 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 Very good. Tamara? Now. To me. Not to Tamara. Tamara. Tamara, right? Yeah. Tamara. I'm sorry. It's Friday. Tamara. You're beautiful. Thanks. Um, you yes, you have to have the cover page. Do you have an analysis? Oh, we had an analysis. Alright, so we have pressure, right? We have high pressure, and we also have another requirement. And it starts with an H, and it's created by the, the elements or hydrogen moving around. So hydrogen is moving around, these other elements, correction not elements, but particles are moving around, creating friction, which creates, raise your hand, Maddie, yes, heat. So those are the two things necessary. We'll see a, a diagram or chart here in a minute to show you the temperatures required for the formation of a main sequence star. White dwarf, the, the atoms are so dense that the electrons take up less than the normal amount of space. They're kind of squished in together. Um, gravity must be extremely strong to do this. Small mass star never reaches main sequence. So what kind of star would the small mass star be? Ethan? The brown dwarf. Oh, my bad. Makes sense? That was one I didn't get. Yeah, we're just trying to... We just learned about the brown dwarf. So... It doesn't reach a uh, main sequence because it never gets into equilibrium where it has enough heat that the temperature just doesn't get high enough for fusion to occur. You have to remember that on Earth that a lot, if we ever do fusion on the Earth, that is from hydrogen, we've done it, but it's just not economical. That's part of the reason why I don't expect it to be a viable source of energy in the future because it takes a lot of energy to do it. So you have to get that energy from somewhere where you're going to get it. You need it from solar power. Um, then what are you going to do with it? Well, are you going to heat water? Heating water is not very efficient. 
the goal is always to make electricity directly because that's what we use to you know run our computers run the air conditioner and things like that we really don't want to heat water the milliliters cross out and you have the answer ours what do you get when you add a proton plus an electron Tamara? Yeah, you get a neutron. So you would think, you know, there would just be neutrons out in the universe because pro protons plus electrons make neutrons. Um, but there's more diversity. Maybe you can study that and help us understand a little bit more. Um, the Earth's moon is smaller than Pluto, and that's why people don't think that Pluto is a planet. Well, our Earth's moon is larger than Pluto. Thank you for correcting me there. Yes. Okay. So Earth moon larger than Pluto. Everybody say that that supernova explosions happen because the core has formed a very stiff neutron star that is the core and the falling outer layers rebound off of it the basic the neutrons prevent further collapse of the star so it stays there so the stuff that falls off of it most likely would be the elements that are located on the periodic table neutrons those wouldn't be elements those would be the particles that make up the atom. It's up there. Top of the board, to the left. Okay, excellent job.